nosotros a los nuevos tiempos, reinventarnos, de desaparecer eh, para crear un nuevo sistema moderno y eficaz que ya se entiende por todas. So, Gilles, it's so exciting to have you back at SciArc. Um, we're always glad to see you. So, I want to start out just by asking you, because a topic that's been coming up in multiple ways and often with multiple meanings has been the term discreteness. Can you just walk us through what you mean by that term when you apply it to your own work? From my perspective, I mean, it really came back through the notion of computation and to mm -hmm. the idea that a computational process works with discrete data. There's an ongoing debate between actually Mario Carpo, Milic mm -hmm. and myself about the notion of discreteness in relation to the digital. My generation and a bunch of people in the Bartlett started to propose that actually to be digital it would also require basically that it's not only happening in the computer but also in the physical world and that you can actually think about physical structures being to a certain degree having digital part to whole relationships. But the idea then between say a digital material or a discrete physical component would be something like a pixel or a unit materialized in form that then has a very limited set of potential connections. Yeah, that's yeah? the perfect definition, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, you could also argue that actually it's also the properties of that building block, that voxel, that make it in a way digital. And they're essentially like kind of generic elements that can appear at any moment and through the recombination start to obtain meaning. So they're a little bit like data, right? Like part of my work is also looking into what is actually the scale of those things, right? And I'm, I'm trying to kind of not make it that indexical, that it is a lumber size or that it is something that a robot can pick up, mm -hmm. but as, like essentially questioning also at what point my own project moves on when the scale becomes maybe too big or, or, or too small, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I just wanted to add also another point to um, that debate about discreteness. Uh, because so I've just wrapped up the AD, uh, which you're also part mm -hmm. of, right? And in the introduction, I also acknowledge that essentially all kind of architectural movements, whatever they are, that denominate themselves are always choose the wrong word. Mm -hmm. So discreteness is definitely in many ways kind of a wrong word to choose. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the important parts that it doesn't cover, which are embodied in the work is the connection to politics as well and the, con the connection to basically looking at the digital not just as a formal project but also understanding that the digital has really important social and political consequences which then lead me also to say that we shouldn't use the word digital anymore at all but we should actually more use for example the word automation which immediately has political and social um, consequences as well. Mm -hmm. The goal of architecture is not being digital, right? Like there is no other industry that questions like, oh, we're, you know, we have to be digital. They basically react to external you know, circumstances and try to think about how the digital could make the process more efficient, how they could obtain a larger market share through the digital, etc. Like they never have this kind of existential struggle, of course, also because architecture is you know, operating in it's a cultural project as well. Essentially, the questions that are kind of coming up in this AD is really thinking about um, the digital in a way, like thinking through notions of automation and thinking through notions of access, etc. And those questions are actually answered in the AD by many people through the notion of the part. I get a little bit concerned when the focus is on terms like automation and along with that notions of, let's say, mass housing, mass production, yep. kind of like the mega modern project mm -hmm. um, that you've referred to. Yep. Are you simply making it easier to have more of the same? Are you simply making it more efficient to keep things basically the way they are? Does a, a project that aims to make it easier and cheaper to keep going the way we're going, simply allow that process to cantilever out a bit farther. And I use mm -hmm. the term cantilever advisedly when it comes to your work. Mm. I think the, the basic notion of accelerationism is that you speed up things to the point that they don't work anymore. You know, people like Nick Cernicek and Paul mm -hmm. Mason and a whole group of people actually came back to that notion through the digital, right? Because they started to basically argue that digital technologies make things so accessible that you don't actually need capital anymore to produce. Not for everything, not for everything yet, but for a number of things you don't actually need capital anymore, which means that they become in a way democratic, that they become accessible. But one of the things that I think you cannot essentially be against is against like efficient and rational production. Like there's no reason to be against that. That's just it's a good thing, It depends right? on the kind of production that is coming out, right? In my opinion, efficient and rational production mm -hmm. in existing systems is actually pretty problematic. We're not reproducing existing architecture, right? Like one of the kind of key arguments that I'm making is that automation is a design project. It's not a project of robots. It's a design project. Like we're actually crucial as architects in 
understanding how we could automate production. While we are redefining basically the way how you, you know, this set of part the whole relationships, can we also make that a creative project? And like for me, I'm, I'm very interested in this kind of really kind of nihilistic, almost end of architecture. Like for me, it's really like saying automation is a design project and it's a start of a really interesting creative question. And things become much more accessible, they kind of pixelate their way out into the world. And yes, I do think that is nihilistic. And I do think that is a proposal for the end of architecture as a cultural project. Mm -hmm. Modernism was a moment where architecture literally flipped inside out. Like uh, all of a sudden you have the Maison Domino, which just puts everything upside down. It, it challenges all conventions. It's even so radical that Le Corbusier didn't understand it when he made it. He was not even able to see how, how mm -hmm. radical that was, right? What you see there is really architecture, you know, working with industrial mass production, which is something that everyone thought was scary, right? Concrete, factories. Industrial mass production was there already, but they never managed to understand the kind of the radical possibilities it would have if they would question the kind of a pre-existing cultural agenda. The arts and crafts, they were essentially, I would say, like reactionary and conservative because they, they were sad about the fact that like handmade artisanal production had left and now they were confronted with industrial production and you know for them that was a kind of a death of architecture right um, but then the people that truly made a click in a way or the modernists who looked at things that the art nouveau and arts and crafts people would dismiss as being inhuman they were looking at project of reinforced concrete these abstract forms and they were like this is a, a cultural project right and that for me is like if you think now back at where we are now, where of course our first reaction is like, if you chop up everything, no more cultural project, we're basically lost in this kind of cold and like world of efficiency of the digital and like, where is architecture there? I want to kind of take a progressive position there and say like, maybe this is actually both becoming accessible and potentially having a social agenda, but also becoming an important creative project. One of the things that's fascinating about architecture to me is in <sighs> fact a disconnect or a lag between the technical possibilities that it confronts in any particular moment of time and the socioeconomic and the political opportunities that it can address at any mm -hmm. particular moment in time. And then a kind of reserve or a well of let's say habits or aesthetics that fall out of step with that uh, larger mm -hmm. context. But in your own thinking, you've set up the space actually for an architectural project that has a lag between what can happen and what might happen, what ought to happen, what even yeah, uh, we uh, can't uh, imagine happening right yeah, now, yeah. which would be somewhere over in the kind of expressive excess mm -mm. that has characterized yeah. architecture yeah. as we know it. On my way here on the plane, I was reading Inyaki Abalo's book, uh, The Good Life. Uh -huh. And I yeah. think actually I was really, really intrigued by his article about Mies, because mm. I mean, I have an affinity with Mies, yes, which, you which you may know. And I think it's pretty clear that my work is not the Hannes Meyer approach. Yeah. You know, you can easily talk about automation and efficiency without a kind of a lack or an architectural agenda, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, then actually, if you look at how what Inyaki Abalos is saying about Mies, it's mm -hmm. actually that it has this lack, right? Mm -hmm. He describes the three courtyard mm -hmm. patio house, mm -hmm. which yeah. is, you know, made of brick for absolutely no apparent kind of clear reason of efficiency. It's actually there as something that has, you know, a much more complex relation to architecture. It's more like the brick is there because we can. Like, I think that's actually super interesting that Mies is not that easily kind of understandable, right? I would want you to be much more honest and aggressive that that is part of your agenda. Mm -hmm. Even if <coughs> we were to transform mm -hmm. uh, the production of housing and uh, uh, give mass housing to many, many more people all around the mm -hmm. world, we run the risk of rushing toward a future that mm -hmm. we've arbitrarily determined to be the case. Mm -hmm. And I think that preempts the real power of architecture which is its ability to be radically untimely mm -hmm. and to be radically out of sync with the world that it finds itself in. Some of the most magical kinds of projects that you've done, even a project like the Talon Pavilion, you have to take a third look. You look once, you look twice, and so mm -hmm. the third look, you can kind of convince yourself that you're looking at something that was actually built. Mm -hmm. And then when you start to realize that that blackness that you're seeing that looks like an inkjet blackness is mm -hmm. actually tar, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. There's that disconnect between the kind of sensory experience of the thing and the way that it appears in the world. Mm -hmm. That power is, in my opinion, where architecture actually is capable of saying, you know what, we don't know where we're going. Mm -hmm. There's no need for nihilism here mm -hmm. yeah. because there are always alternatives and other <coughs> possibilities on the table. 
like I think a lot of my work is actually relatively primitive. I would say like my work has a kind of megalithic aspect to it from time to time, you know, that like the digital is actually also fundamental and primitive, mm -hmm. right? Like that's a kind of a quality that I think is inherent to architecture, right? Like that kind of slow, primitive, fundamental way of thinking, not the kind of the, the quick surface, right? But the kind of the, the, that slowness. I would also say that the problem that we face today in terms of what needs to be fixed, and we mm -hmm. can define that in a lot of different spectrums, and we understand how those things are interconnected today better than we maybe have been able to in the past. The problem is a problem of imagination. It's not actually a problem of technology, and it's not actually a problem of tools. And we can up our technology and we can up our tools as much as we want, but until architecture gets involved in the cultural project of changing people's imaginations and in what they believe to be possible and what they believe they are capable of doing in the world, it's in a losing battle. That to me is the ultimate nihilistic position.